Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. everybody to Nightlight. I want to thank Ken Quiet Hawk for his amazing introduction. There's no voice like his for sure. Would love to have you check him out on the internet. Ken Quiet Hawk, he's a native storyteller and he and his wife are preserving history in a very unique way. I'm really, really excited about today's show. I have Gary Lechman in uh, with me again and <clears throat> he is the author of many books on the links between consciousness, culture, and the Western esoteric tradition, including Dark Star Rising, Magic and Power in the Age of Trump, Lost Knowledge of the Imagination, Beyond the Robot, The Life and Work of Colin Wilson, and The Secret Teachers of the Western World, and a ton more. After the show, check him out on on, um, Amazon because you'll find, as I have, that his material is fascinating and thought-provoking, and it will change the way you view your reality. Um, his, his books are just profound, and I have thoroughly enjoyed the several that I have read and the many that are on my list of to-dos when, when I get a spare moment or talk him into coming back on the show, of course. He writes for several journals in the U.S., U.K., and Europe. He lectures around the world, and his work has been translated into more than a dozen languages. Obviously, he has a lot to say. In a former life, he was the founding member of the pop group Blondie, and in 2006, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Talk about eclectic. Before moving to London in 96 and becoming a full-time writer, he studied philosophy, managed a metaphysical bookshop, taught English literature, and was a science writer for UCLA. He is an adjunct professor of transformative studies at the California Institute of Integral Integral Studies. And the book we're going to be talking about today is, is a topic that has fascinated me, intrigued me, and I almost want to say titillated me. His, his, the book is The Quest for Hermes Trismegistus, and um, he's a character that um, I have been fascinated with ever since I heard of him. And I just, I think this book was written just for me. So welcome to the show, Gary. I'm so glad you're here today. Well, thank you very much for having me on again, Barbara. And I'm very glad that you're enjoying the book. Oh, um, it's it's like it was you know a lot of the stuff that you've written and, and I've read I've read a couple of your books now, um, you 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 investigate so thoroughly into the topic that you've chosen that that you make people stop and think about how they're viewing the subject matter and I know in in Holy Mother Russia um, I came out of it with with a profound change of perception as to the people of Russia and, you know, why they are like they are. And, and with this book, um, at the very end of the book, you, you, you do say, I think maybe we should all go back to 
the philosophy of, of Hermes Trismegistus, and, and I'm 100% with you. So, um, <laughs> you know, you, you seem to have been writing for me. It's almost like you're my own private library. You know, you, you pick topics that I wanted to investigate. You do all the work, and then I get to chat with you about it. So it's a lovely relationship we have going on here. Um, <laughs> What, um, you, you know, it, a lot of people haven't heard of Her- Hermes Trismegistus, and sure, of course um, they've probably heard of Toth, the antediluvian, mm-hmm. but but Hermes Trismegistus is, um, of course, the name for Toth, or Toth is in there. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe we want to, you know, first tell people basically, historically, who he mm-hmm. was. Right, sure. Well, uh, Hermes Trismegistus, and that, that means thrice great as Hermes. Um, he's a, um, well, for a very long time, he was considered a, a, a real person, a real figure uh, that lived in the ancient time. It's only, um, well, relatively in the last 400 years that um, scholarship um, came to the conclusion that um, he didn't really exist. Is a mythical or a fictional kind of figure. Um, but he was thought to have been the founder of magic, the founder of learning and, and writing and the alphabet and science and a variety of other scholarly and, and philosophical and, and um, magical kind of uh, discipline and, and had all this knowledge. And um, he was believed to have written these, these texts uh, these books that came to be known as the Corpus Hermeticum, you know, the body of the Hermetic writing. And um, for one thing, uh, those texts, when they were translated um, from the Greek into Latin um, in the mid 1400s or late 1400s, they had a profound influence on the Renaissance. And the fundamental vision is of um, the notion of the microcosm and the macrocosm. So if you know that idea that uh, human beings, rather than just being one thing among many other things in in the universe or one animal among many, many other animals, we are actually uh, a mini universe. We contain the entire universe within us. The macrocosm is the outer, you know, physical outer space. There's an inner space within us. That's the microcosm. And within us, we contain all of the forces and energies and laws and, and so on that operate out. Uh, in the outer space. And um, that, that's a fundamental kind of metaphysical way that, that they see the, the, the place of um, mankind in, in the cosmos. And it's out of this that what we know is the hermetic kind of sciences like alchemy or astrology or magic in the sense of being able to draw upon the powers of the different planets and, and so on and so on. Um, uh-huh. So, uh, yeah, so he's this kind of... Um, super mage philosopher sage that was thought to have been older than Plato and even older than Moses. Um, and he was, there's even um, in places like Ravenna and, and, and others, uh, uh, well, in the Vatican, there are even uh, chambers in the Vatican that are um, painted with images of Hermes. And, and, uh, um, and, and for a brief time, um, he was considered kind of a fellow traveler as Jesus or a precursor to Jesus. And then, as I said, in the 1600s, um, he lost his street cred uh, because <laughs> of scholars, because scholarship unearthed that the, the books, the texts that he was supposed to have been, he, he was supposed to have written in, in the way back time, um, the Greek that they were written in was a Greek from a later time. So put it simply, it, it was a Greek from after Plato rather than before Plato. So it, it, it couldn't have been written at the time it was thought to have been written. And um, and then, you know, it was realized that he was sort of mythical. Uh, the the books were probably written about uh, between 100 or 200 A.D. in, in Alexandria uh, at this time when there was a great kind of um, sort of sort of spiritual religious kind of melting pot there with a variety of different uh, um, religions and spiritual practices. There were the Hermetics, there was the Gnostics, there were uh, early Christians, there were the indigenous Egyptians, and so on and so on. And what I did in that book was sort of, it, it just fascinated me that you had a figure that was very, very important for a very long time, and then people believed it was actually real, and then it turned out that he wasn't. And then he, he's he's sort of the, what do you want to, call, what do you want to say, that the he's sort of the head of the, of the initiatic chain that um, is 
supposed to, you know, this wisdom has been carried down for ages and ages. And now it forms this kind of counterculture in the West, you uh-huh. know, the, the magic or the or magic or the occult or the hermetic, the esoteric kind of counter tradition to the Western tradition. Although, you know, as I point out in the book and other people have, you know, much of what we consider the official Western tradition is actually quite influenced by this as well. Yeah, that's that's the one thing that, that um, you know, I, I understand that according to all of the, that you've written, that, that you know, he was um, sort of like the, um, he became like like the head of this philosophy, but he didn't exist, so they needed somebody to pin it on. Um, mm. but, and, but when you talk about magic, um, and, and I've found this in, in other places too, that the magic they're referring to is astrology, is, um, you know, your, your esoteric sciences, your, your uh, mm. meditation, your out-of-body experiences, your, your remote viewing. It's, it's, it's not the magic that we think of today like rabbit out of a hat, although in some places taps that well, turn into, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, snakes and stuff well, like that. Not, but, yeah, yeah. but it's so I was just... Gonna say, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not stage magic. It's, it's, you know, sort of real real magic with real powers and things like that, yeah. Yeah, and and I think what what really fascinated me so much was that as I was reading about all of these philosophers and all of these different um, cultures and things like that that were taking on his philosophy, the philosophy that he was presenting. I mean, it's it's very much close to Christianity before it became a corporate entity. So that so mm. that. And and the Jews, for some reason, don't recognize him. I, I believe is what you said in the book. Um, I don't know. Well, I don't, well, he's the, one of the things that happens um, in Alexandria at this time, and this is why we where this figure Hermes Trismegistus comes from is, as I said, it was a melting pot of different sort of um, religions and spiritual traditions, and um, what happened was that. Um, Greek gods and Egyptian gods started to blend together or aspects or, uh-huh. or characteristics of, of Greek and, and Egyptian gods that were similar. They, they decided, you no, know, they were very syncretic. They were, let's, let, let's put it together, you know? And so they put them <laughs> together and Her- Hermes Trismegistus is a combination of uh, the Egyptian god Thoth, who is yeah. the god of magic. He's the, he's the scribe. He's the ibis headed god who, you know, has the, has the, the, the pen and, you know, he's, he's making a record. And again, he's the God of writing and he's the one who helps Isis, um, uh, basically, you know, uh, get pregnant by, by the dead Osiris in order to give yeah. the birth, birth to Hor- Horus and, and, and the Greek God, um, Hermes, because at this time in Alexandria, Alexandria was, was Greco Egyptian. It's an Egyptian. Well, it's founded by Alexander the Great. But he he had conquered you know Egypt at this time, and um, yeah. uh, so um, this is you know you find similarities. So in the sort of Judeo Christian, I mean yes, as I said, there was an argument um, in in the in the early uh, early Renaissance about how Hermes was a precursor of Christ, and yes, there's very there's a lot of similarities, you know. Um, the relationship between Zeus and Hermes and, you know, Jesus and um, God and, and Jesus and all of that, and the sun um, being very central and, and a variety of different, you know, kinds of things. Um, but um, you also find uh, Enoch is from the Old Testament or, or the apocryphal books. He's considered sort of uh-huh. an equivalent to Hermes. And then later in the um, Islam, um, um, Idris, um, in in uh, the Islamic tradition is considered a um, equivalent to Hermes, and so uh, this worked out well later on for the pagan, in the sense of Greek pagan, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the followers of you know Plato or or, or, or Hermes uh, when yeah. the Arabs uh, took over, because they were able to say, okay, well, you know, we we're um, we are we are devotees of Hermes, and Hermes is Idris to say, well, okay, you're you're part of the book. You're you know you you belong to a religion in the book. So that's certain. <laughs> well, later in later years, you know, if, after when they when they sort of when Alexandria was um, captured by the Arabs in the 
six, uh, the six hundreds. Uh, so you had this kind of blending going on a lot. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, Hermes was considered um, a teacher of Jesus in some, in some contexts. And so there was a good argument going on in around the 1500s that the Hermetic writing should have been made part of sort of Christian, you know, um, uh, canon and so on and so on, but it, it, it didn't come to that. Um, but, um, that was one of the fascinating things, uh, that, that happened there in Alexandria then that you had all these different, you know, um, it was sort of like today, you know, kind of spiritual marketplace, you know, uh, we had a variety of different beliefs and, uh, available. And, and then you had this, what, what I, what I call the hermetic diaspora, where um, fundamentally when it's the rise of Christianity, when Christianity becomes the favored religion in, in later times, the Roman Roman Empire, and um, then the official religion, and they start persecuting the pagans as the first ones they start persecuting. And they, they flee Alexandria, and then they, 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 they spread out in different places, and, you know, it, um, it gets picked up in the Arab world there. Well, I think, it, I think what fascinated me about the book was that you went way back to the beginning and, and you know, brought it through Plato and Socrates, and and then you know you brought it forward, and you know here and there I would recognize the name Swedenborg, and you know I, I rec- what I found fascinating was that that if a text of any sort has credence or validity, it stands the test of time, and mm. the Hermetica does stand the test of time. I mean, through through generations and centuries, this material. You know, sometimes, as as with the uh, Rosicutians and and you know some mm. of the others, it was underground, but it's still there. And I think that that what amazes me and fascinates me with the material still to this day is that it it stands and has great validity for a way to live your life that mm. in, in today's times would be far better than, than and, and Christianity, while it's fundamentally and, and down to basics, fabulous, it has become a corporation, and therefore oh. it, 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 it has lost some of its magic because of it. And mm. what, fa- what fascinated me was, was how when you got to the Egyptians and when some of the advice was practiced dying, um, yeah. I loved that part. Um, it, it's sort of like, you know, letting go of the here and now and letting your, your conscious. I mean, there's a great deal about spirituality and allowing your spirit to, mm. to soar. And, and, I mean, you know, if there were a church of this philosophy, I'd be a founding member. Um, <laughs> that's what today is. Well, there is. Well, I, I well just yeah. Said it, I, I would say that there is, in the sense that you know, this, the whole, whatever you want to call it, the new age or the uh, sort of occult revival that started um, uh, sort of in our time back in the 1960s and gradually became more part of you know mainstream culture because there's a widespread interest in some of the fundamental ideas because it is like you were saying out of body experiences. It's all. It's about uh, when you said practice dying. I mean, I, I I start the book by asking, well, you know, we we always talk about this this wisdom from Egypt or this ancient knowledge that was, uh-huh. that was came out of Egypt. And so, what exactly was that? You know, what what you know what you know why what did you know Pythagoras? He was supposed to have gone to school in Egypt. Plato was supposed to have gone to school with Egypt. It was sort of like the equivalent today, where somebody goes backpacking in you know either you know in Asia or somewhere, you know, India or something. Um, uh, and, you know, back then, okay, yeah, everybody went to Egypt. And so what exactly was it, uh, you know, that they, they learned there? And um, I, I brought in this um, interesting idea by his fellow Jeremy Nadler, who, who um, um, uh, did a book about uh, Plato and, and Egypt and this, this kind of shamanistic tradition in Egypt. And um, it, he, he relates, you know, do you know this motif of sort of dismemberment that's in the shamanistic tradition, the shaman tradition. He, he goes through these, sort of these experiences and he feels that his body is sort of, you know, dismembered. It's all kind of cut up into bits and pieces. And he relates that to the story in, in Egyptian um, mythology about Osiris uh, being killed by his brother Set. And um, mm-hmm. Set cuts him up. And um, for the... Egyptologists and alchemists 
the French Egyptologist and alchemist René Schwala de Lubitsch, he equates uh, this um, dismembering kind of um, motif with how the rational mind works, um, with what he calls cerebral consciousness. Uh, it, it breaks things up into bits and pieces, uh, and uh, it, you know, through analysis, it, it, its approach is analytical, and that's why it's so successful in science. But he he, he um, uh, sort of relates that to what he calls the intelligence of the heart, which is this. Uh-huh. Uh, it, it's it's, a, it's a, another way of knowing uh, the world, which is more holistic. It's more participatory. It it, it doesn't stand apart as some something separate analyzing the world it, it partakes of the world in well your book um, it's about with the intelligence of the heart with... you can you know rise with and, and you can t- tumble tumble with the boulders so uh, yeah so um, that what is that wisdom about you know what, what does that come from and it has to do with basically dying in the sense of quieting your body so that your mind uh-huh. your consciousness can can Rome free, and this is what the, the hermetics were about. They were about inducing these ecstatic states of what we, we've come to call cosmic consciousness. Uh-huh. Well, what, what's fascinating with your book is that it kind of goes along with a lot of the other material I've been reading late, of late, talking about how the hieroglyphs in Egypt were much more than people you know, understand them to be, that they were uh, symbols of philosophies that, that that have been lost in time, so to speak. And when when you go into the Egyptian stuff, it it does it does wake up a lot of the the same material that I've been seeing in other places. It, it's almost as though I you know when I when I read through it, it was like this is what people have to learn. This is you know you 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 find that consciousness within yourself because everybody's different, so it's a different way of finding it mm-hmm. for each individual. And and the one place that you talked about, um, one of the one of the areas that are preserving this kind of philosophy are the um, are the Freemasons, which I found fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's many um, motifs and themes and symbols and images and even, you know, sort of rituals and things of that sort that ha- have roots or, or, you know, have, are, are, are hermetic in, in, the, in the Masonic tradition. And, uh, I mean, this would go back to the earliest times. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, um, sort of expert on contemporary, um, Freemasonry and I'm, I'm not a Freemason and I've, 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 you know, not participated in any of these things, but I get the impression that it's not, it's, if any, any of that that's still there now is just sort of part of the, the, with the, the kind of, um, dressing, you know, the, the, the sort of, the, the, uh, the, the, the kind of, um, ritual that they go through, but I don't think it's necessarily something that, that's fundamental to it now. Although, you know, in the earlier times, uh, it was, and it was one of the ways in which these, this kind of tradition, because at a certain point, I mean, it had, it, it really went underground um, with the rise of what we know as science, uh, because it was a competitor. I mean, the Hermetic tradition by the by the beginning of the modern time, you know, uh, the seventh, uh, 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 17th century, the early, the early 1600s, it was a competitor both to to mainstream Christianity, the Church, and also to this rising, you know, new new uh, contender of science because it, it it basically wanted to wed the two things together: the kind of the spiritual aspect of religion and and the scientific, you know, um, um, understanding of 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 the uh-huh. world aspect, you know, of, of and it was a competitor to both. And uh, strangely enough, the two uh, the two things that became uh, enemies soon after the church and science sort of ganged up. Uh, to get it out of the way, uh, and um, so it was. It was, you know, based on on a kind of real knowledge that was um, thought to threaten, you know, the other, you know, uh, kind of power um, bases, and um, yeah. So other places, the Rosicrucians, they were sort of like the first kind of secret society. And did they really exist? You know, they, was, they you know, they were nicknamed the Invisibles because no one was ever to really find them. And, uh-huh. uh, there was a whole whole idea that it was a kind of hoax, but a hoax with a creative purpose in order to 
stimulate people into becoming Rosicrucians themselves, you know, um, rather than having to find them to join the club, you can start, you can start your own club and be, and be your own <laughs> Rosicrucian. Uh, and you could did that by following uh, this kind of path, you know, that was based in this notion of what was, what was called pan, pan Sophie, meaning all wisdom. So not, uh-huh. not just, uh, it, it included the hermetic, you know, pursuits, and all that, but it also included, you know, the, the rising natural science and also a kind of um, progressive, uh, more tolerant Christianity. Because that was another part of it, too, is the idea that all the religions are, come out of the same sort of fundamental insight, the same fundamental revelation. Uh, what, oh, what, we later know to, what, what, what we later know today, what we know today is the perennial philosophy. But this was something that was very, I mean, we say that now, but it was very um cogent and urgent at the time because you had all the you know the, the religious wars happening in in in, um, in Europe you know this is like the <clears throat> beginning of the thir- thirty years war and all that and the, the, the you know they had the Protestant Reformation and all these kinds of things going on so it was, there was a real urgency to, to the idea that you know we, we we need to get this message across that you know all the religions are sort of based on this and you know Judaism as well so you know so Catholicism Protestantism you know the Eastern Church. Um, Judaism, Islam, you know, um, and uh, I mean today it's not as popular idea because we're more we're back to this notion of everything being separate and fragmented, you know. Um, so, so the, the we're all one idea in terms of religion isn't isn't as popular because the, the whole notion of identity politics and people wanting to be you know their specific yeah. faith uh, but, but, and, and culture, know, it, but not 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 being you know subsumed in in some other bigger one and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, it, it's to me, it's it's fascinating in that Christianity has changed over time in order to survive. Um, Judaism, mm. the same thing, and and with this philosophy, this Hermetic um, philosophy, it, it's it's kind of risen into practice for a while, and then it sunk again, and then it it, it there is a an eternal part of it that comes through time and is adapted for the time in order for the philosophy to be practiced. And mm. I think it's, it's fascinating in that I, I can't think of anything else that has stood, um, th- that has survived in, mm. in its entirety. I mean, the, the Magi were, were magicians, but they mm. were also, you know, that they had the same type of philosophy. They were called magicians, and yet they yeah. were studying science and well, we spirit get, well, at the we same get, time. We, yeah, well, we, we we get the word magic from from the magi. Um, yeah. So they were the original original magic. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's a lot of that tradition in uh, um, in the broader kind of you know uh, Western esoteric um, you know the sort of the Chaldean oracles, which um, I. Uh, I mentioned, I think, in the book, but that's another, that's another one of these texts, uh, these works that are these sort of prophetic, um, ecstatic, you know, kind of visionary um, uh, writings about the nature of the universe. And, you know, fundamentally, it's that, you know, spirit is, you know, the, the ideal realm, the, the realm of, 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 of the, you know, the, the metaphysical, not, not the physical world. The, the physical world is, you know, the sort of the lowest on a kind of chain of being and, um, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a radiation or emanation from some higher realm, but you know, we're sunk in this physical realm here and we have to reawaken our awareness of, of the divine. And, you know, that's, that's a very kind of thumbnail sketch of it, but that's fundamental. So, and that's similar to the hermetic, this awaken this spark of cosmic consciousness in us, which we're, we, we can, you know, we, it, it says, you know, if you want to understand God, you have to become like God and, and it says, you know, imagine yourself to be anywhere and, and you're there in a, in a moment and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're back in the womb or you're out, um, you know, um, flying around the planet. So there's all these kind of, this whole idea that your mind is not, you know, I mean, we, we now in our modern day, the scientific view, you know, our, our mind is this kind of, you know, steam that's given off by, by this lump of, of, of gray matter in, in, in inside my skull now. And, you know, the whole idea that it, it has any kind of existence outside of that is just kind of illusionary, you know. But we all know that's not true. And and there's uh-huh. scientific evidence that, that, that that's not true. I mean, that there's a, you know, um, there's, there's a wealth of uh, statistically impressive and convincing uh, evidence about, you know, a variety of different 
what what we would call paranormal, what you know they're talking about in the context of this experience of cosmic consciousness. Because yeah, I mean they are talking about having paranormal experiences or some mystical experiences, you know, of feeling at one, you know, part of the of the whole. They talk about the one, the all. You know, there's there's there's, oh, yeah. there's the, the the fundamental one, and then there's the multiplicity of everything. Um, you know, and, and and it's that it's that you know being part of that totality that's the aim of the, the seeking cosmic consciousness. I know in in many places they they used um, drugs to get to the those states of consciousness, and then then there were others that did not. They got it by climbing mountaintops, or you know had personal experiences. Oh. Um, and, but you know, it's coming around again today because there is a a definite. Um, well, there's there's greater interest in you know the Emerald Tablets of Toth, and you know that that philosophy comes comes out with as above, so below as well. And mm. um, so so that so that it it it's almost as though this information finds a way to touch every generation in one way or another. The philosophy is still mm-hmm. there. So there has to be something extraordinarily important or it wouldn't have survived time. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. I, 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 I think it's rooted in um, our, um, well, uh, our, our psyche. You know, it, it, it's, um, I uh, it's 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 rooted in our two different hemispheres, I would say. You know, our two different cerebral hemispheres, and this is something I talk about in later books, um, Secret Teachers, and uh-huh. a book called Lost Knowledge of the Imagination, where the kind of the the, the, the sort of participatory consciousness that the uh, Hermetic teachings aim at evoking, and that Schwalo de Lubitsch talks about as the intelligence of the heart, and there's a variety of other ways where you can talk about it as well but it's 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 this intuitive consciousness in which you feel a part of you know the, the whatever it is that you're observing whatever it is that you're you you're in this rapport with as opposed to our usual way of seeing the world as something completely separate from us that we have to take so, apart you know in order to understand so i'm just saying so i i would say the hermetic uh, uh, you know there's the there's the kind of what i want to say there's a kind of attitude a hermetic attitude or a hermetic way of approaching the world. I mean, there's the kind of the the tradition in terms of the books, the writings, and, you know, the the whole astrological tradition, alchemical tradition, there's all that. But then I think there's also, it, it's a kind of way of looking at things that's fundamentally about synthesis rather than analysis. It, it's fundamentally about finding relationships between things. It's, it's kind of, you know, a- analogical. It's a way of looking at things through analogy rather than, um, you know, sort of cause and effect, and so, you know, it, it, it's so yes, I, I and I think that's related to or linked in or anchored in a, a whole way of being that that's just part of who how we are, um, but we've we've marginalized that for the last few centuries, uh, but it's not going to so go away. Happened, it's never gone away. So, so what happened to humanity? Because there was a time where <laughs> this was not only a a philosophy that people mm. talked about openly, but practiced openly, and mm-hmm. and then it's then it suddenly um, fell from favor, whatever you want to call it. I mean, still kept alive in certain areas and aspects of of our cultures, but but so what happened to us? Because that was a that was a golden age. Oh. Well, I say and, I, I say in other books. I think oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, and and it's just sort of like you know how did how did we lose the golden age and you know come back into an age of mind as opposed to spirit? Well, I, I it's part of what I would I write about in other books and uh, just fundamentally it's uh, what I would say is evolution of consciousness and so I um, there's good reason to believe that at a very early time in in, in human history or, or you know uh, in prehistory. Uh, mostly, that our consciousness was not the way it is now. Um, as I said, where we, we have a very sharply defined outer world and an inner world, and, you know, we, the outer world is what's really real, the physical world is what's really real, and it's something that's completely other from us, and, it, you, know, we, we, it, you know, it's completely oblivious <laughs> to us, and so on and so on, and, you know, we learn about it, you know, through trial and error and all that, you know, just how we experience the world. But at an earlier yeah. time, it was more like... 
uh, well, different people have said this. Steiner said this, Gene Gebser, Ian McGilchrist in his book, The Master and His Emissary, about the left and right brain. And other people have said this. So it's, I'm, I'm not saying anything new, but actually I'm putting together what these other people have said. And so, but what happened is that gradually we lost that because for whatever reason, uh, we took the road of developing our individual egos or individual selves as, as separate. And there was a great loss, a loss of contact with, you know, the source or as Gene Gebser calls it, the origin or the one or nature. But we gained in freedom. We gained in self-consciousness. This is, this is, this is coming out of the garden, you know. The, the golden yeah. age for me, I would say, is when we actually, we, we didn't have the kind of self-consciousness that we have now. And we became, as Adam and Eve did, became ashamed. It knew, knew they were naked in, in the Garden of Eden. And uh, suddenly they, we became aware of ourselves. And uh, I mean, if and if you look at many of the creation myths in, in different mythologies, um, you can see them as fundamentally there are myths about the, the appearance of consciousness and your self-consciousness and uh, light and, and so on and so on. And so um, that I was for whatever reason. I mean, I, I argue in other books that, you know, nature or God or whatever you want to call it, did it on purpose because it's necessary for us to develop individual egos. It's necessary um, uh, for us to develop. Um, you know, uh, independence and so on. And, you know, we lost a lot, but we gained a great deal. But it's part of a longer kind of arc in which that earlier participatory consciousness, which I'm relating to the Hermetic tradition, doesn't go away. It, 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 we marginalized it, but it's still there. And I would say now, 400 years, more or less, since the eclipse of Hermes Trismegistus prestige as an actual you know, figure, real figure, and hence um, the the authority uh, of of the text. We 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 need to, and I think we've begun to in different ways, start a process of trying to bring these two sides together. Because as I said, they're do we they're housed within our skulls and in, in, in our two um, the different hemispheres of our brain. You know, uh, which you know one one sees the world very different than the way the other one does. And, and, and the kind of one that breaks the world up into fragments in order to understand it, which is absolutely necessary because it's what made us survive and made us dominant. Uh -huh. that, that's become too, it, it's done its job too well. And it, it, it's not allowed, you know, the other side to, but it, the other side doesn't go away. You know, it appears in a variety of different kinds of um, expressions, you know, in dreams and in, in, in uh, intuitions and, um, you know, in, uh, inspirations and you know and so on and so on. So um, I, I kind of look at it in this long picture, where there's a, a development and the polarity between these two kind of opposing ways of knowing the world. But at times they come together. When they come together, that's when you have these fantastic creative periods. Yeah, that's when magic happens. Absolutely. Mm, mm. So, so, so it, it's it's. It's coming to realize that we are not just the physical, but but the physical is basically the vehicle the spirit travels in, and the spirit is eternal. So that so that you know, linking a con a, a conscious understanding of the fact that that this is a brief moment in time. It is not all there is. It is a piece of all there mm. is, or a stepping stone, if you will. But um, I, I think that that as with all your books. There, there's, there is absolutely a piece of inspiration that is, has, I mean, I mean, you've written a ton of books. How you could have researched all of them and still, you know, be functional is amazing. So, so how are you led to what you're going to, to write about? Because, because there is this concept in every single one of them that, you know, my, my frame of reference, my world is is the metaphysical world, and so mm. I think part of the reason I'm I'm so attracted to your books is that there is something of a spiritual nature in everything that you've written. So how do you? I mean, I don't think you sit down and just say, "Now I'm going to write about Madame Blavatsky or Alistair Crawley or you know." Oh, no, I mean, no. how how well, I mean, are you drawn to the topics you write about? Well, I mean, it's the practicalities of, of you know, writing for a living. So um, it's, yeah. it's very good if you come up with an idea that a publisher is interested in. So uh, with books like Blavatsky, um, again, it, it was similar to uh, 
with my book on Rudolf Steiner, it struck me that there wasn't a good, readable, sympathetic but critical, you know, biography of her. Uh, there were biographies that were by, you know, um, theosophists, devotees. Um, what was it? Uh, I think, I think it was Helen Cranston, I think, uh, this massive one that I plundered gleefully, you know, for all the information in it. But, you know, it, it, it's, uh, um, uh, or there's, there's you know, critical ones that, that are, that they can be fun to read, but, you know, they're basically, you know, she was a, you know, a, a, a kind of a lovable rogue charlatan and, you know, quite, you know, quite, quite the character, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, so on and so on. Um, but I, I, and so I just thought, yeah, no, there's a place for, um, you know, uh, a book that took her seriously and was interested and, and wanted to know. And I wanted to uh-huh. understand, well, exactly who, who was she and what, what was she about? So, I mean, for me, it's sort of, it's a question. I, 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 I the book, you know, um, I write the book to answer the question basically to myself, or I want to know about this. And so I, the best way to learn about something is write a book about it. Um, so, you, you, well, you know, so yeah, and then, you're, you're, um, you're... And no, I, mean, I, I like lo- to read. Lo- I, I read a lot. And I just I read a lot. And I make a lot of notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, basically, Blavatsky, it, yeah. Blavatsky, you know, it comes across in lots of places as a crazy old lady with a monkey. Um, mm-hmm. And but but you know, when I read your Crowley book, I I came away with a a, a totally different um, take mm-hmm. on who he was and what he was doing. So that so that you you really and and with Hermes Trismegistus, I mean, mm. I knew a little of what you wrote about. Certainly not the extent that I mean, I didn't know all of it. And but but it, it's fascinating that you seem to be looking for. It's almost like you're that that blind statue of justice that holds the scales. Mm. You know, you're not you're not looking for the pro or the con. You're just looking for the truth. Yeah, well, I and think that yeah, a, a, a few people have said to me that you know, there's, you, you uh, it seems like I'm always trying to get a balance. That that is it. I'm trying. I'm trying to say, okay, well, you know, um, fundamentally, here's how I see it. Here's the information, and I I think people can pick up how I sort of read things from the tone, you know, and and um, you know, um, because some you know some some things they're they're wonderful stories. If nothing else, these people. Had fantastic lives. I mean, Crowley and Blavatsky had, you know, incredible, uh, for, you know, for whatever you think of them, and not necessarily enviable lives. You wouldn't necessarily want to have their life, but no. they did, you know, remarkable things. And and then the, those two had an, uh, a very good sense of humor too. They were, they were, I mean, they were very funny. I mean, Crowley was a, a bit more dubious character than Mad Blavatsky. I think I, I don't think she ever hurt anybody, and but, but Crowley was a bit. Could be a bit nasty at times, uh, and that. But it's also um, it, it's a, a question comes up. So one book leads to another. Um, that, that's um, something. So um, you, you write about something, and you can't get everything into one book, and there's some things left over, and uh, and then you develop, you know, an idea. Um, it's usually a question. It's some kind of question. I mean, with Crowley, it was. I mean, he was one of the first people uh, read when I was first interested in all this sort of thing back way back in the day when I was in, in music and, wow. um, this, you know, in, in New York in the seventies. And you know, he was in this context of, of kind of the rock and roll world and all that. And so, um, I had a Crowley period. I, I got into it. I practiced the, the rituals and read the books and, you know, did the exercises and, and so on and so on. And then after a while, I, I just got tired of him because it's rather claustrophobic because he's, you know, he, he in, in the long run, he's, he's sort of megalomaniac and he just likes to talk about himself a great deal. And he can be very funny. He's a wonderful raconteur in his confessions yeah. and all that. But I, I, I just, in the long run, got very close to, felt very claustrophobic in it. And I, and I, and I, you know, left, left that. But then years later, I saw that there was all this kind of academic interest in him. And I just was really surprised that he had gone from being, you know, the wickedest man in the world and, and the beast. And then, you know, there's people doing PhD theses on, on his on his work. And I thought, oh, that's, yeah. that's quite an interesting turn, turn around. And um, I just wondered, you know, so what what was the story? Did I did I miss out on something? You know, uh, you know, gee, maybe I should check him out again. And um, I also wanted to answer the question why he remained a kind of rock and roll icon. Um, 
uh, out of the 1960s, 60s, 60s, that's when he was rediscovered. But, you know, people uh -huh. like Madame Blavatsky were uh, discovered then as well, and, and uh, um, others like Jung. Jung is on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's with, with uh, Crowley. And, and so on, yeah. but you know they, they they didn't stay kind of rock and roll icons uh, or pop culture icons in the same way that Crowley did, because he was picked up by rap artists, you know, later on, uh, and and all that. And so I was kind of looking at that and how I got interested in him in rock and roll. So I was sort of bit telling my own story, trying to understand his story. I mean, in the long run, I I, I think he, he's 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 a kind of um, cautionary tale. His, um, I think he was a man of genius. He was certainly brilliant in many ways, but you know, he just had um, personality problems. <laughs> he was completely oblivious well, to the people and completely focused well, on himself. Yeah, but, but he was basically searching for unity with the one. He was looking for, you know, he was he was look he was looking for the cosmic gnosis that that you know everybody does search. He, he was doing it in his own mm. way, but. Um, you know, I, I came away from reading. I, I only read one of your books on 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 mm. him, but I, I think in India, I think is the one I, mean, I read. Right. I, I, yeah, we we've talked about that one, but I I came away with a better understanding as I did with the Russia book that um, mm. that there was a side to them that I had not known of or seen, and once you put all the sides together, at least as much as you've got, you have another way of looking at this person or these people or this situation. I mean, and, and back to Hermes Trismegistus, I mean, I still prefer to think of him as a man. I mean, I understand he's not, but, <laughs> well, the, ph well, but, the, but the philosophy, yeah. as, as far as I'm concerned, he's a man. Um, but but the he encompasses a, a philosophy that I find very comfortable, and and mm. I think anybody who who reads the book will, once they've gotten through it, and and you know I I think your books, fortunately or unfortunately, are the kind of books you have to go through more than once, um, but but this puts things in a, in a different perspective for people, and you know they can buy it or not buy it, but you know I'm fascinated with the emerald tablets, I'm fascinated with all of that mm. material, mm. so. So having a little bit of background as to how that came apart, the you know, Emerald Tablets, mm, eighth yeah. century, sure. you know, basically. Sure. But but then you get you get into people like Dr. Doral who channeled all of his material from the White Great White Brotherhood on 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 oh. the Emerald Tablets, and and again here's the philosophy oh. coming at you in a different oh. way, um, well, symbolically yeah, different, yeah. but coming at you. Yeah. And it it makes everybody think about their own right. spiritual journey, which yeah. which I'm in love with, because mm. because everybody's journey is different. But but you know, have some information, understand where it comes from, understand you know Plato and Socrates and all of these guys, they weren't just you know old men sitting around. They were they were people that were <laughs> digging into the meaning of consciousness. They were talking mm. consciousness, and mm. and. I think today people don't understand that, that, that getting heavy duty into understanding the, our purpose in the, in, the, in the cosmos, our consciousness, mm. you know, where it's been, where it's going. This is a topic that has been spoken about for thousands of years. It's not just well, news in the 20th or 21st century. Yeah. Mm. No, it's fundamental so, questions of human reality. So that's, that's why, that's why, Plato and the Hermetic books and all the you know great uh, religious and spiritual traditions and philosophies they're all relevant because they all deal with these fundamental issues that are the same all the time you know why do I exist <laughs> why does the world yeah. exist uh, what's going on can I speak to the director please you know where's, you know, yes. where's that's you know um, I mean and this you know uh, the thing is that we are in a uh, historically um, where you know we have a we have a, a long heritage behind us you know uh, a long tradition behind us and uh, uh, we we live in this post everything world now today where you know every all of the things from the past all of the um, sort of what they say the narratives or the ideas of how we saw ourselves you know whether it's religious or 
you know, um, scientific or in terms of progress or, you know, whatever, all, all these have kind of um, uh, become, um, you know, unbelievable. You know, we don't, we don't understand ourselves. And so um, we, we, you know, we, we're in the position of like when the existentialists said in the early 20th century that we find ourselves thrown into the world and we just don't know what we're, what we're here for. So, I mean, um, one of the reasons why there's a popular interest in say the hermetic tradition or a variety of other kinds of spiritual traditions that are outside the mainstream churches or not the scientific is that they offer some possibility of getting some kind of answer to that question. And uh, fundamentally, in these traditions, what it has to do is, is with an experience. It's not just the teaching. It's not, it's not like a dogma. That's, that's the main difference between, say, the esoteric or the hermetic or the Gnostic kind of traditions of spirituality rather than the sort of uh, mainstream, you know, orthodox um, churches is that they, 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 they ask for faith and they offer, they offer dogma. So you're given something uh-huh. to believe, um, but you're not necessarily given an experience of, of it. And you're not necessarily given a kind of knowledge as a kind of inner uh, knowledge. And, but that's what the hermetic traditions offer. I mean, whether you actually achieve it or not is up to you. It's up to your efforts. Uh, but they're, they're fundamentally about practices that um, provide a kind of felt experience of, of, of the kind of knowledge. How much further ahead so you, do you think you come to, you come, When they're talking about... It, it, what do you mean? Now, how, how much further ahead do you think we would be if we hadn't, if we, if if the uh, library at Alexandria had not been burned? Uh, <laughs> God, who knows? Who knows? Who knows what was lost? You know, what can you say? I mean, it's one of those things you never. I mean, there's many, many. You know, there's there's many things that we only have reference to. We know they existed at one point, but there's no there's no copies of them. But we know other copies of text mention them. So there's many things that we know were in the library that we'll never see. So, you know, sadly that happens. I mean, one of the things I do say in the book is that um, this, this collection, the Hermetica, this collection of writings, it itself got lost um, uh, after sort of the, you know, in Alexandria, uh, this, this, this birth from Alexandria. And only bits of it were available for a thousand years. And the, when it was rediscovered in, in the Renaissance in the sort of 14 mid uh, late 1400s um it was it was rediscovered precisely because of huge historical eruption the fall of constantinople to to the turks and uh-huh. so all these church all these churchmen and scholars were fleeing uh, you know it's istanbul today but all the churchmen and scholars were fleeing constantinople and they were selling their libraries and cosimo de medici who was the big power broker in florence he was a he, he was a book lover and he had a book scout out there and he scooped up all these all these books and what he brought back was and you have to remember this is the dark well the end of the dark ages or the I I call them the dim ages because you know it's not supposed to call them the dark ages so the dim ages in any case uh, <laughs> okay it was back I mean all, all all these Greek we we lost all that that's precisely where they they were, that's precisely why they were the dark ages and precisely why the Renaissance was the Renaissance because they were rediscovered and. But the point I'm making is that, you know, these frail scrolls of, you know, paper on which these uh, magical and, and mystical, you know, writings uh, were uh, survived through, you know, eruptions and, and, and wars and, and, and invasions and all this kind of thing. So there's this kind of metaphor of, of the life of the spirit, you know, survives through all of the chaos of, of, uh, of, of the world. Um, and, um I mean, you know, there, there's there, there's a wonderful passage in it's uh, another Hermetic text called the Asclepius, where they they um, sort of um, bemoan the fact that the 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 people have lost faith and they no longer, you know, uh, pray to the gods and they no longer perform the rituals and there's a whole sense that you know the the great days are are gone and, and, and the dark, dark days are coming. And this is in ancient Egypt and, and it's applicable to, you know, well, it would have been, you know, it was very applicable to the, the last several years uh, in contemporary time, but um, not to be too over, over enthusiastic, but perhaps some of that's changed with recent events. Uh-huh. But um, 
Um, but I, I, I think the thing, you know, at the end of the book, I, I said, I, t- I talk, it's about this notion of this kind of Hermesian spirit. It's a spirit of bringing things together and it's a spirit of asking questions rather than having answers. Um, I mean, I, that's the kind of tradition. I, I like a tradition, a tradition that asks good questions rather than one that provides answers. And that's, I guess that's the difference between kind of a dog, dogmatic kind of, okay, here's, you know, this is the strict the word this is how it is and we, we're not going to alter any of it and you know if you follow this you'll you know you'll be saved and the other is more dangerous and uncertain but you if you put up with that uncertainty this kind of hovering um you're able to experiment with a variety of different you know ways of seeing things and putting things together and again it's precisely what you were saying it's about seeing the world in a different way it's about and this is one of the things, one of the people who influenced me um, a lot I, uh, I don't, uh, in a, a book, mine, book of mine called The Lost Knowledge of the Imagination is dedicated to her. It's Kathleen Rain, and uh, she was a poet, an essayist, and a, a Blake scholar. <clears throat> uh, and um, she said that uh, the imagination doesn't see different things. It sees things differently. Yeah. So it's not new fact. So we're not looking for new facts. We're looking for a new way of looking at the facts we already have. And this this is a different you know point of view. It's a a, a, a different way of interpreting the, the the data. Put it that way that we have. And again, the Hermetic philosophy is about seeing the world itself as symbolic. You know, um, it's uh, the notion of correspondences as above, so below. So um, the, the phenomena, I, the, pheno- the phenomena of the world are, are symbolic of, of higher um, realities, you know, in, in, in the spiritual realms. Well, I, I tell everybody that you know you you create your world by your perception of it, and um, if, if you don't like something, perceive it differently. It it, it does work. I I, I think that. This is a book I would highly recommend that everybody read because it does make you understand to a greater degree really the control you have over so much in your life. And it's a matter of, of taking that power back from, from, from yourself. You know, we're, we're, we're taught things, you know, by parents, by teachers, by society, by culture, by, by lots of different things where we're, we're, we, we put ourselves in cages and the only way to get out of it is to break out. And, and you, you have to do that from inside. You, you, it's not something you do from outside. If it, if it were a conscious thing, it would be so much easier, but it, it's not. It's a, it's a higher consciousness striving to make a point to the consciousness. And uh, I, I think everybody's going through this kind of battle, especially at this particular point in time. And, and so understanding that there are philosophies out there, there are, you know, we're walking pathways that have been walked before, but, but oh, so you can't follow. Constant. Yeah, and, and, but you can't follow another's pathway. So you, you have to understand that there are always options <clears throat> and, you know, be creative about finding them because once you're creative, you open yourself up to a whole new um a whole new channel of energy that's within you. So um, I just noticed the time. Um, I am. I, I want to thank you so much for being here and talking with me. And um, I, I know that uh, you have tons of other people you're going to be talking to. So I am so glad that you could squeeze us in. Um, this material is profound. We could go on for hours and hours and hours, but maybe just an hour is enough for some people to get so fascinated with the thought of looking at the quest for mm. Hermes Trismegistus that they will buy the book and read it themselves. So, um, <laughs> well, I hope so. And, oh, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's the fundamental thing. The fundamental thing is to have curiosity and to want to learn about things. So um, that's, I would say that's the fundamental key to changing the reality is you, you learn um, about a bigger one. And, um, you know, you rise up out of, you know, um, where you are at the moment and you see further horizons of, of meaning and, 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 and uh, um, understanding and knowledge. And uh, that in itself is a remarkable, you know, experience. Absolutely. And understanding that there are always options. And you just have mm. to quiet yourself to let them 
come into your consciousness. They're there. Um, <clears throat> but I don't have the option of stretching this time any further. So, <laughs> uh, Gary, I, I want to well, well, thank lovely, you again. Lovely, well, thank, yeah, well, uh, absolutely my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks again, and thank you, everybody, for listening. It was my pleasure to talk with, with Gary today, and uh, hopefully some of you out there will check out his amazing library of books he's written and check into some of the material he's put out there to challenge you. Take care, everybody. Talk to you soon. <laughs>